Well, good morning again. I'm so excited to be back with you today. And I just want to, before we get into today's message, I want to look back for a moment and I want to thank our team here, our staff, uh, for the incredible job they did and they always do um, in my absence of continue to bring church online. I also want to thank um, my friends, Pastor Josh Gresham and Pastor Kyle Harnett for filling in over these last two weeks. I love those guys. I appreciate those guys. And I'm glad that you got to meet them and we'll hear f- more from them in the coming years together. But I also uh, want to acknowledge something that you may have seen uh, during hosting or online in the days leading up today, just so you're aware that we are live right now, but we're actually filming this a couple days ago on Friday with just myself and two other staff members here, even though I did have a negative COVID result today because someone on our camp staff received a positive COVID test a few days ago. And just the way our teams work together, we thought it was the wisest thing to do, knowing that we wanted to defer to the marathon that we are on together in our community and the purpose that we share, as well as just be rooted in this idea of of love towards neighbor and towards each other that we went online today exclusively. And we'll have updates for how we will resume when we resume coming this week. But I just want to acknowledge that from the beginning as well. But again, I'm so glad to be back. I'm excited for the message I have for you today. And you know, as Eliza and I were gone for the past two weeks, we were actually on her family's farm in Lewisburg. And it's a little bit outside of Lewisburg. It's in this little town of Rennick or Frankfurt. And it sits right above where the mouth of Spring Creek hits the Greenbrier River, as well as it gets intersected by the Greenbrier River Trail. And it's absolutely becoming probably my, my favorite place on the planet that we can travel to within a couple hours. It is beautiful. And I remember the first time that Eliza said, hey, all of our family, and when she says all of our family, she means like 30, 40, 50 people are going to the farmhouse and we're staying for the weekend and hanging out. That was kind of my worst nightmare, to be honest, the first time. I'm going to meet all these people. We're going to be in a dilapidated farmhouse. First question, how many bathrooms are available for that many people? It was crazy. But we showed up, and it's absolutely not what I imagined. It's beautiful, and we're so thankful that we got to get away there. There's animals, there's cows and chickens, a, a pool, and it's just so beautiful. Well, there's this one spot that I like to go to that's just over the hill that I know there's a lot of family history with as well. But it's right over the hill from the farmhouse where you can get in Spring Creek and you can go just swim, you can fish or whatever. I remember one night that we were there, I had gone down, the girls are in bed, and I had gone down where I always do. And I noticed, not for the first time, but I really like actually noticed and thought through the fact that I was entering Spring Creek and looking underneath me were these two long old railroad ties. And I had heard stories from the family that just above the creek, between the creek and the house, that there's this hill, that there used to be, that used to be a pathway where trains went through. And I think even the bridge that's right there used to be where their old post office was. And it made me have this thought that at some point, right where I'm standing, I'm standing on rail ties that began their life as a tree and at some point became this important piece of this vibrant life that was happening right there as a new timber industry was attempting to get this product out to market. These railroad ties that now lay lifeless, dormant, dead in in many senses, in this creek, buried in silt and fish and wildlife once served an incredible purpose. And as I think about that, I was reminded of this image of driftwood, in fact. And I thought maybe you don't have a rail tie to go to, but you can think of this idea on the beach that there might be a driftwood. And there's been um, some shows even in recent years that have talked about and shown how valuable this sort of wood can become as it gets turned into furniture or artwork or sculpture. And on the surface, here's this piece of wood that is dead, that it has already served its purpose, and that it is just laying there lifeless. But the reality is, it is absolutely beautiful. 
And because of the beauty that can come from cutting this piece of wood into lumber or into artwork, it is extraordinarily valuable. And when you look at it through the lens of as it actually lays, lay here, it actually provides shelter and food for birds and other wildlife. It can also become the foundation for building, the foundation for sand dunes as they naturally occur. And just the idea of these railroad ties and this driftwood brought together an interesting question for me because I would love, you know, if this piece of wood or those railroad ties could talk back to me, I would love to hear its story. I want to know how did you get here and when did you get here and what was your journey like? But for you and I right now, with life as it is and the disruption we're facing, the difficulties around us and really being right in the heat of the summer where things we're hoping continue to get back to some degree of normal, I just wanna ask you this question. Do you feel like you are just drifting through life right now? And I think that's kind of our tendency anyways, that we can really hit the cruise control button and perhaps we have been in some sort of drifting cruise control for a while, but we weren't just aware of it. And I wonder if the current loss of our illusion of control has caused you to lose your way. Maybe your sense of hope, your sense of purpose, your sense of value. And whatever the reasons are that cause that sort of drifting feeling, I want you to know that you're not alone in that. There's many folks right now that feel that, but there's, the Bible is also chopped full of people and groups of people and examples of people just like you and I who found themselves aimlessly drifting through life. In fact, there's an entire book of the Bible in the Old Testament, Exodus, that literally is the story of a group of people that wandered around in a desert for many, many more years than it was intended for them to do so. And then on the other end of scripture is in Revelation 3, John gives this picture and it's a warning to the church at Laodicea that says, please don't, it would be better for you to be all the way cold or all the way hot rather than lukewarm. In other words, he's saying it would be better for you to pick and choose something than to just aimlessly drift through life. As we think about that reality that many of us, many of you watching right now, right now may simply be feeling like you are tucking your tail and drifting and just trying to manage the day to day, I want to encourage you to ask some different questions. I really want you to even think about what beauty exists in this moment. The beauty of those railroad ties and that driftwood as it sits on the beach and the landscape it provides and the potential artwork and furniture. There is beauty in that drifting. There's beauty in the fact that that piece of wood created, served its purpose, now finds itself where it does. But even more than that, in this cultural moment, what is God doing and who is God building? I remember several years ago, I was uh, in, I think, my third or fourth year coaching uh, Taze Valley Christian School soccer team. And I went to school there, graduated there. So I played basically all the teams that were still on our schedule. And I remember that heading into our summer practice that I felt like, our team felt like, our coaching staff felt like we actually stood a chance, given the talent that we had, the development that had taken place over a few years, to beat a team that had really just beat us for many, many, many years. And I'm not talking like competitive close matches. We're talking, I think at one point I lost a, a soccer match 17 to zero, which is unheard of. And they weren't even trying to run up the score. They were just that much better than us. And so I remember us getting together and I knew that the season ending championship was going to take place on October 28th. And from the very first team huddle of that season, as we gathered to practice, I handed them a bracelet, a wristband that had 1028 printed on it. And from the very beginning, we established that our goal, all the work that we were doing in the on the practice field and in games, the development that was happening, the camaraderie, the shared values, all of that was coming together, hopefully for a victory in this championship game. In fact, every day we actually ran a mountain where we were practicing, where we'd get up and we'd huddle up and we'd have our devotional thought and our motivation thought before we started practice. But it always aligned towards this particular goal 
together. And guess what? The underdogs won at the end of the year. We, they played that season with the most sense of unity and shared values and the culture was healthy. They played like their cleats were on fire and we beat that team in the championship game and people were blown away. It was still completely unexpected. But as I think through that and I think through where we find ourselves and I think about where we find ourselves as a church, I think we're in a similar moment that God has given us all the tools that we need. He's given us the people, you. He's given us each other in this moment to rally together, to get aligned, to find some unity and some community and health and growth and create a context where you and I will flourish and we will no longer drift through this life. I feel really, and you know, I don't pull this card very often with you guys, but I really have this sense of God telling me to tell you and to tell us that it's time to stop drifting. It's time to come to your resting place and find the beauty in the moment and be a part of building and becoming what God is doing. In your lives personally, it's time to reorient around what God's gravitational pull is to meaning and to purpose and to hope and to peace and to wholeness, all of those things. I feel that that is God, what God is telling us. In fact, when we think of this through the lens of who we are together, I want to encourage us in this, that though the world has changed, our mission absolutely remains the same. And there's something that I love about the mission that you and I share, the thing that unites us together. And the first is that you and I, we're part of a movement. We're part of a continual unfolding of God's story. This moment in history that we take place in is not simply an event. It is a part of God's historical, his story that he is weaving together with you and I. The second thing is this, that with the power of his Holy Spirit, it utterly, this mission that we're on, it depends on us, not me, not you, but us together. It's an exercise of our community together. And so what I simply want to do with our remaining time together is provide some clarity to that mission as if we are back on the soccer field first day of practice and we're about to run the hill for the first time and I'd hand you a wristband. I simply say, although life is rough right now, although there's questions that are unanswered, although that we are getting increasingly polarized and I get it, you're weary, I'm weary, you're ready for things just to be less heavy and taxing. I want to get in front of you today and put some clarity to our mission, to our vision of who we are becoming together. And I want to put some clarity to the process that we are on together in community at this moment in the movement that we belong to through Jesus Christ, through the beauty of what God is building. Is that all right? Is that all right? That's what we're going to do. And here's the first thing I want to encourage us towards is this, that we, you and I, as we think of ourselves as a, move, as a community, a part of a greater movement, that we are defined by progress and growth, not success and failure. Just a few weeks ago, SpaceX launched two astronauts to the International Space Station for the first time from U.S. soil with a U.S.-made rocket in a while. And it was an incredible victory for our country and for those that were part of making that a reality. But if you know the backstory, you know that there were many, many, many iterations of failed attempts, failed builds, failed rockets that literally cost millions of dollars and blew up on impact of just trying to take off. It's so important for you and I to think through our life and the journey that we're on right now, not through the lens of success and failure, but through the lens that everything that God puts in our path and the moment that we are living in together right now is part of our progress and growth. The same way that each one of those failed rockets for SpaceX led up to the success of a successful launch, those weren't failures. Those were points of learning. Those were points of change. And to put it in the language of how John described it in his letter through the lens of pruning, those were moments of actual growth. And culturally speaking for a moment, there's a guy that I love to listen to and pay attention to his writings. His name is Mark Sayers. And he talks about that 
that there's this idea that's prevalent culturally that our identity and our power is ultimately performative, meaning that our identity is not received, our power is not received, it is ultimately achieved. And because of that, we have what he coins as a secular salvation schema. Essentially that says, I can perform my way to happiness. I can perform my way to growth and identity and acceptance and power and value and wealth and influence. I can perform my way there. Well, you can imagine many of us actually live and think that way. It's not just an out there thing. I know that it's creeped into my home, into my way of being, but that creates extraordinary pressure. And really it screws up your sense of identity. And the good news is that Jesus gives us a totally, totally different framework. And it has massive application on our life. I want you to think through like one of your worst failures right now. Maybe it's recent. Maybe it's years in the past. But maybe you haven't fully even moved on from it. What if you looked at your failure through the lens of growth rather than the lens of a total negative experience. When you and I think of our life and you, we think of the life of our church and the movement and the mission that we are on together, when we internalize it through the lens of growth and through the lens of progress, not success and failure, we recognize that you and I, again, to borrow from Paul's language in the New Testament, we are running a race that is not a sprint, it is a marathon, and it will require endurance. And the good news, when we let Jesus rewire the framework of how we think of ourselves and interact, interact with ourselves and take away the pressure of success and failure through cultural means, we know that every aspect, every conversation, every success, every failure can actually be a point of progress and growth. As we think about that as a church family, I want to be really explicit with you about how we even measure that. What's part of our scorecard? What are we thinking about? Because I will tell you, it matters to me how many people come and are part of our, our, our family and our community. It matters to me the health of how many people are on teams. And, but, but we can really easily get stuck in a way of measuring our success right now by how many people are watching online. Or how many people will be sitting in seats here? There's far deeper questions that I want to measure our success with because they're about progress and growth. And let me just define it really quickly. I believe that a central part of who we are together is that the lost, that lost people get saved and that they, they become apprentices of Jesus. And in their apprenticeship, they find healing and they find purpose and they find belonging and they find community. And as their lives open up to other people in that healing process, they begin to lead others in the same process. And guess what happens? Health multiplies. Leaders multiply. Sacrifice and generosity multiplies as what is personal becomes more powerful in community. That's who we are. That's who we're trying to become. And here's a second thought, and it relates immediately to what we're coming out of, is that we are radically generous people. The natural overflow of a life that moves from lostness to apprenticeship to healing and to leadership of others in that same process is a life of generosity. Jesus led the way, and he used the language of time, talents, and treasure. If you think through those three things, are they in alignment with what God has put in your heart as a result of who you are in him? And all that we've been given, all that you've been given, is ultimately a stewardship linked to a greater story. I've said this before. I love my wife and my daughters in ways that I can't describe. But I know my parenting of my two daughters is ultimately a stewardship. I don't own them. 
I didn't make them. I didn't create them. They are God's. They are made in his image and his fingerprint of love and identity and purpose is on their life. And my role is to love them and to steward them and to nurture them and to protect them and help them to discover not who I want them to be, but who God has made them to be. You and I are the same way, whether it's our money, whether it's our gifts, whether it's our purpose and our talent, whether it's how we interact with other parents at the softball field, whether it's how you interact with the guys at the golf club or at the bar or in life in general, at the cubicle next to you, it is all a stewardship that God has given us. How are we living invitationally? How are we living with an open hand to other people? And I just want to say this, that in this cultural moment, a key piece of our generosity is actually to choose the mess, the messiness of forgiveness over cancel culture. And when we are radically generous, there's another aspect of who we are together that will take place. Isn't that number three, that we will live at the pace of love. We will live at the pace of love. Dallas Willard, I quote, him, I quote him often. I've quoted him before saying this very thing, that the enemy of spiritual formation, which is a fancy way of saying the enemy of your progress and your apprenticeship with Jesus, of your growth and your apprenticeship with Jesus is hurry. Jesus interacted with his disciples. He interacted with those around him, not in a hurried, can't be bothered way, but at the pace of love. And is it possible that one of the reasons that so many of you right now may be hearing me and sensing that you are drifting in life, drifting away from family, drifting away from happiness and fulfillment, drifting into shame and regret? Is it possible that one of the many reasons that you are drifting is actually because as the world has changed, it has taken away the facade that comes with speed and hurry and it's forced you to come face to face with who you really are and you don't like it. How many times does that happen? Where we look at ourselves and we get actually introspective and, and it messes with us and we just bounce. Is it possible that some of the drifting that's taking place has to do with uh, that as the speed and hurry of life has been taken away, we've been forced to confront our own humanity in a way that it's messing with us. And here's what I, I also want to tell you, that your heavenly father, the father of your soul, the one that created you and made you and loved you, the one that is calling us together to live in a greater sense of purpose and impact and love, he is walking with you at a pace of love, the same way he wants you to live at the pace of love. Pace, the, your pace of love with him and with others is always connected in relationship. Imagine going on a, da, a, a date right now with your boyfriend, girlfriend, your husband, or your wife, and you do it as fast as possible because you got to get back home to the gaming and to what you guys are watching on Netflix. Guys, if you do that, and your wife or your girlfriend picks up on the fact that you are just phoning it in, even on date, trying to get home as fast as possible, that's not going to go well for you. That's not how this works because you know, and I know, in the, our relationship with each other and with God, that there is a pace of slowing that makes sense with our sense of love for one another. Here's the fourth thing that I want to I aim ourselves towards in this season is that we pray big prayers, big prayers. And, and I'll be super transparent with you. This is sort of hard for me because if you're around me long enough and our team knows this, I kind of like to see how something's gonna work out from the beginning to end. I like to draw the roadmap. I like to think through the strategy, the communication plan. I like to see the spreadsheet, but that is not how this life actually works with God. It lacks faith, to be fully honest. And if it's achievable in my own power, I'm not depending on God. I'm not relying on the source of my strength and your strength. 
And I want to just key you in on some big prayers that we and I am praying for our church family. And here's the first one. This is a prayer that we will be a church that heals. We will be a church that hurting people run to, not away from. Mental health, family dynamics, marriages, emotional health, trauma, you name it, that we will be a community, people that are trained and have a posture that we bring healing, that hurting people run to, not away from. We're praying big prayers that we will be advocates for gospel-centered justice, that we will actively engage and discern from a gospel-centered, a kingdom-centered basis, the end of issues of racism and gender inequality and an extreme economic disparity, lack of opportunity, sex trafficking, food insecurities, homelessness, mental health issues, the gaps that emerge in our life that are issues of justice. We're praying big prayers that God will put us right in the middle of that to make a difference for his glory and in his name. Here's another one. I don't know if this has ever been on your radar before, but we're praying big prayers that we will be a church that ultimately plants churches. That we will be so healthy, so vibrant, that so many lost people get saved and go through the process of apprenticeship and become leaders and invite others into it, that this place is never meant to contain all what God is doing. That this physical building is really where relationships come together. That we are support center rather than end all be all. That we will send out leaders and teams and that there will be this, this really difficult thing for us and our leadership. That at some point, I hope that we send out our best leaders out of this place to go plant somewhere else so that the gospel and the kingdom and his power and his health and influence goes forward. Who is waiting to know Jesus because we haven't sent you to them yet? And the ways God can do this is literally limitless. It doesn't mean we have a building. It could mean that you start a group in your workplace and you work through services and Bible study during your lunch break. Man, that's being the church together and we'll see what can blossom there. We can see what happens at the ball field when the parents are together for the 4,000th time watching t-ball practice. Maybe some stuff can happen organically there or in the coffee shop or in the marketplace in natural. What a what if we were to buy a, a restaurant and run that restaurant as an outpost of our church, hiring people and, and leading people and allowing people to come into an environment and a culture steeped in who God is and kingdom relationships? What if that is a part of our future? We will be a church that plants churches. Let's pray for that. I want to boldly declare that with you today. These are some things that we are working through together. This is where we're heading. This will protect us from the drift that you may be feeling. It will help you find belonging and meaning as we are joined together in a movement on mission together. And here's the last thing. There's many more things, but the last thing to bring you today is that we seek genuine transformation and renewal. Let me explain that a little bit. When we were in Lewisburg, there are three small Methodist churches within about a 15-minute drive of one another. And my wife's grandparents uh, were integral in one of these churches. And, and they're seen now, and if you're familiar with the Methodist church, as a three-charge appointment, meaning whoever pastors that church actually pastors all three and I was just thinking, because I went to a seminary um, that is very built on the leader, the founder of the Methodist church, John Wesley. And he and a band of other people at one point, not too long ago, by horseback, had such a drive and a zeal and a passion, a fire in them of what God was doing in them that they couldn't contain themselves from riding throughout the frontier land of this new American experiment, planting seeds of the gospel in rural communities. And as I drove past those churches, I was just blown away by the fact that these small, tiny country churches that are struggling so hard now, at one point were the very front lines of folks 
reaching new territory with this message, this hope of Jesus. That today, when we think about our church and our life, and we think about the things that we do well, and we think about the things that we are committed to and we believe are effective and helpful and will make a difference to help us reach more people, I recognize that there is no amount of effort that I can do, that our team can do, that you can do together that will make a difference if it is not connected with God's Holy Spirit bringing absolute transformation and renewal. And as I saw those churches, I thought about the fact that there is no way that proper strategy and spreadsheets spreadsheets, and just a good plan led to the fact that these churches are still in existence. But I think about the fact that they no longer, for the most part, are growing and vibrant and still have this pioneering spirit. For you and I, transformation, renewal happens when you get to the end of yourself and there is nothing to rely on but the power and the presence of God. That's what we need. We are committed to methods and to form and to things that we think and we know and we prayerfully discern are right and effective, but ultimately we know that in my life and in your life and in our life together, none of that is effective to bring transformation unless it is filled with the power and the presence of God. We don't want to be a church that is great at giving you information. We want to be a vibrant community that the Spirit of God is working in us and in and through you that it brings transformation and ultimately brings renewal to those around us, brings renewal to our relationships, brings renewal to your workplace, to your home, to your neighborhood, and transforms the very things that may be negative experiences right now. A couple of weeks ago, I learned, uh, I was just thinking and praying, and I actually came across a picture that I dove deeper in, you don't need to know about that, of a small port village in Greece where when it is low tide, the, the boats, it's, it's a small fishing village, and the, the boats there just remain in harbor at all times. There's no boat ramp. They don't pull them out. They're just little old wooden sort of sailboats that go out every day and do some local fishing to bring back for the restaurants and community. It's a big part of their economy. But during low tide, the boats that at one point are sitting on the water ready to go actually sink down to where they are sitting on the ocean bottom. And it made me think about right now. It can feel like you are like that boat. That by day and during the right time or in a past life, a past season, a pre-COVID moment of your life or a pre-failure moment of your life or a pre-divorce moment or you fill in the blank for your experience. You were like this fishing vessel that served a purpose, that provided a bounty and an income and had an actual function. You may find yourself that in this moment, it's like, it's like the water has just left beneath you. And there you are sitting in a low tide of life without the ability to move or to fulfill your purpose or have a sense of who you are or what you are to do. And it's got me to thinking, what if, what if this moment of unrest and of drifting is not the absence of God, but it's actually the preparation for the tide to come back in with power bringing transformation and renewal in our life. Let me make this a real tangible idea. Right now where you are, whenever you're watching this, take a big deep breath in and hold it. Hold it as long as you can. Yeah, now, okay, let go, let go. And at some point, it is inevitable that as you take that breath in, it has to come back out. What if that is what God is doing right now? What if all the things that we feel is this negative experience and the, the world is cycling out of control and beyond our reach and beyond our grasp and it's hopeless and that's what it feels like maybe through the loss of a job right now or through the loss of a loved one 
or through just the loss of a sense of any sort of meaning or happiness or a minor setback to a major setback, what if what God is doing right now is actually writing a much bigger story and we're yet to fully pay attention? What if we've been looking at this all wrong all along? Because maybe the tide is out right now, but just like that breath, and it has to exhale, the tide will come back in. It is never permanent. And behind the break is this churning, this regathering power, this waiting to come back in and bring hope and to bring power and to transform us and to bring renewal. What if this time of preparation is actually a time to raise our expectations, not to lower them? What if it's a time to depend on God's presence and his power, not ours, not ours like never, never before? What if what we are walking through is the greatest blessing that we may experience in our life that gives us the space and the time and the grace and the relationships and the power of reflection and the power to really rely on God and to lose our illusion of control? to break down the facade and the masks and all the things that have just kind of created smoke and mirrors around our lives and has put us in touch with who we really are and with God and who our true selves are becoming in him. And it is actually a time to raise our expectation, to put some anchors in the ground, to quit drifting and to get aligned along what God wants to do through us. Because here's what I will tell you, and here's the truth about how God works. You may have no clarity about what you are to become, who you are to become, or what your individual purpose is. But when you attach yourself to a broader community that is endeavoring to live out of its meaning and purpose and who we are becoming in Christ, God will reveal that to you and maybe what it actually is is experiencing life and connection and beauty and the brokenness actually in community, not as an individual. For you and I, as we think through this and we think through the lens of our church family and we're praying big prayers and we're, we're thinking through the lens of progress and growth, not success or failure, as we think through how that we can eventually be a church that plants churches and advocates along gospel-centered lines for issues of injustice, and we're becoming healthy and growing more like Christ and making a real difference in us. Here's what I, I need you to know. It's true for me. It's true for you. It's true for all of us. That nothing happens through us until it happens in us. Nothing will happen through us until it happens in us. The things that I know God is calling me to and to you to for an outward expression of who you are must begin in you you before it will happen through you. And frankly, I think it's time to make some decisions. Will you, will I, will we together raise our expectations? Will you raise your expectations? Will you stop the drift so that we can be that, this kind of community, this kind of people, this kind of church? And instead of giving the world more information, more activities and more programs, more debate, more opinion, let's give the world more and a clearer and a powerful example of God's presence and power in our life. However you found us today, watching, participating, live, later, or three years from now, however you got here, like these railroad ties in the creek or the driftwood on the beach, you are here. And let's get aligned. And let's ask the God, our creator, the father of our soul, who deeply cares for you and deeply cares for me and deeply cares for us together to align our hearts and our minds around a vision of what can be, not what is, of what will be, not what was that we will put purpose over preference and that it will be radically generous and that we will put the call, the mission, the identity of God first as the center orbit of who we are. And guess what? You may feel like I am just not up to that task. I'm not ready for that. I'm not qualified for that. Guess what? This, This is where that happens. You're among friends. You're among people that are on the same journey as you. And let's do this 
together. Let's align our hearts. Let's align our minds. Let's align our spirits. And let's depend on what only God can do in his strength by his power, not what we can accomplish. Amen? Let's do it together. I love you. I'm so privileged to be part of this with you. And I can't wait to spend a lifetime living in to what only can be accomplished through God's power at a level of increased faith, generosity, sacrifice, service, leadership, multiplication, all steeped into this loving apprenticeship and relationship with God our Father who made you and loved you and can save you and rescue you and bring you into a family, a community that will let you belong and become who you already are in him. Let me pray for us. God, thank you that you are, I just sense that you're, you're calling us to raise our level of expectation, to raise our level of faith, to raise our level of awareness so that we can look 10 years, 20 years, or two weeks into our future when we get there and we can look back and say, none of that was possible. None of that could have happened in my own strength. Clearly, you were working, you were loving, you were empowering, you were transforming, and you were renewing my life. I pray, God, the things that you are calling us to, that you want to work through us, that you will first do in us, and let it start with me, let it start with our leaders, let it start with our team, and let it filter out in a way that, you, that we can't even contain the growth, the health, the multiplication, the impact that we will have together for your name, for your glory, and it's in your name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you again for joining us today. We love you. Stay tuned right here online on Facebook. We're going to flesh this out every day a little bit. We've got five days till Friday. And every day we're going to bring a little bit of content around these five purposes that I believe God is laying right in front of us. Love you and we'll see you soon.